Good evening, Shalom. Welcome to this episode here of Unapologetics, where we are unapologetic about apologetics and blessings to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am your host, CJ Cox. Uh, before we say a brief prayer, I forgot my coffee, so you guys are going to have to wait for a second, and I appreciate your patience. All right, the appreciation of your patience has ceased. So, welcome to this episode here of Unapologetics. And again, we are unapologetic about apologetics. I'm your host, CJ Cox. I have my phone up here because, of course, I'm going to be reading some articles and such off of that. But, before we get started, uh, let's just go ahead and say a brief prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for everything you've blessed us with, Lord. Uh, the ability to study your word without serious persecution, Lord. The ability to spread it out amongst the people, Lord, and to try and win converts to you, Lord Jesus. I pray that you use this for nothing more than the glorification of your word and your kingdom and the revealing of your will. And I pray that you may guide me from error, Lord, that I neither stray to the right nor the left, but walk always down your path, Lord. I pray that we give you all the glory, Lord, in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Mucho dope. Um, <laughs> Uh, being a youth is terrible. Anyways, a um, few announcements, of course, per usual, gracenampa.org, G-R-A-C-E, N-A-M-P-A dot O-R-G, if you would be interested in those um, church services, very good church services. Um, kind of old-timey in a sense, right? There's no rock band playing the hymns. The hymns actually sound like hymns, and, you know, the, the there's no floofy hair on the song leader. So it, it's really kind of cool in all those ways. Um but also, on top of that, you know, just very awesome, spirit-filled preaching and um, actual understanding of the Word of God, which I think is the most important thing you can ever get in the church, right? People who take this kind of thing seriously. So, gracenampa.org, G-R-A-C-E-N-A-M-P-A dot O-R-G for absolutely great church services. Um, briefly again, uh, if you want, you can watch the Watchdogs on Facebook, 2 to 3 p.m. every weekday, except for... Uh, Hasn't been terribly good this week. Uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, Mountain Time, 2 to 3 p.m. every weekday. Fridays, 10 to 11 p.m. Um, and, of course, right after that, these would go on. Um, excuse me. I apologize. are not currently live yet. We, at this point, are still doing them pre-recorded. Um, we do post them still at the same starting time that they would be going if they were live, which is 11 p.m. Mountain Time, uh, 10 p.m. for the two hours on Sunday, and 8 a.m. for the hour on Sunday. Um, but they're not necessarily live, like I said, so it's not, it doesn't really make much of a point to say 8, 2, or 10, 2. Now, eventually, it will be 10 p.m. to, uh, or 11 p.m., rather, to 12 a.m. on Saturdays and Fridays, Fridays and Saturdays, right? for two hour shows, another hour show from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., and then a, um, oh, what is that, two hour show from 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. on Sunday nights, and so total we have four shows, five hours, um, and Watchdog we have six shows, six hours. We also have possible future content coming up, uh, namely my future show, Banquet for Ponder, a future planted rantings from a buddy of mine named Nikolai, and a possible general podcast that we may or may not actually have up. And it's, it's sort of debatable at this point. <sighs> Excuse me. Anywho. Um, don't have too much new information as far as the James White thing is concerned. Don't really have any too much. Don't really. Blah, blah, blah. That was terrible. Butchering the English language. Don't really have too much new information on the Rod Bergen, Boyd Tamela Madiba debate either. But, of course, hopefully we will get more interaction from Dr. White, and hopefully Mr. Bergen will be actually interested in the debate. Um, Mr. Bergen, of course, is a rather busy fellow, so that is the main issue that we actually have there. So, we are going to get right in. This is our point numero dos, right? of Isaiah, talking about Isaiah's prophecies, and actually today we are going to be discussing specifically his Masonic prophecies. We were talking about non-Masonic prophecies, of course, um, on our previous program, so now I want to talk about a lot of the prophecies that actually have to do with um, the coming of the Messiah, right, and what Isaiah had to say about that. Uh, we're going to be using the exact same articles as yesterday, or the exact same um, web articles yesterday. It's about BibleProphecy.com, Isaiah's Prophecies. 
excuse me, as well as uh, reading out of the King James and um, also using some different internet sources here to sort of co corroborate the claims. Although, you don't need too much historical co um, corroboration as much as you do just New Testament co co blah, 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 corroboration. Um, being is that we were talking about Messianic prophecies and not so much historical prophecies. Not to say, of course, the Messianic prophecies aren't historical. It's just their religious nature means that they're going to be recorded in their fulfillment, primarily in the New Testament. All right, so the very first one we have here is Isaiah foreshadowed the virgin birth of Jesus. This is Isaiah 7.14. So if you'd like, please come with me to Isaiah 7.14 before we actually read what the article's got to say. 7 and 14. And again, oh, excuse me, I might be sneezing here in a minute. Nope, good. Um, I will actually be reading out of the King James. You can read out of most other versions. There's a slight dispute on a translation here that I'd like to get to, but we will get there in a second. So, article here. In Isaiah 7.14, the prophet Isaiah addressed the house of David, meaning the family and descendants of King David, and speaks of a virgin conceiving a child and giving birth to the child. Isaiah says this in the context of it being a sign from God. He also says that the child will be referred to as Emmanuel, which means God with us, or God among us. The New Testament books of Matthew, specifically Matthew 1, 18-25, and Luke, specifically Luke 1, 26-38, record details involving the birth of Jesus, who was born about 700 years after the time of Isaiah. Both Matthew and Luke say that Jesus was born of a virgin named Mary and that Jesus is the Son of God. Because Jesus is both fully human and fully God, he literally can be referred to as God with us or God among us. In Isaiah 7.14, there... Oh, this article is actually going to read about it already. Cool. In Isaiah 7.14, there is a Hebrew word, Alma, which many Christian Bibles translate into English as virgin. Some non-Christian scholars claim that the word actually should be translated as young maiden and not as virgin. The fact is, the Bible used the word Alma in various passages to refer passages, sorry, to refer to young unmarried women who were culturally and religiously expected to be virgins. One example can be found in Genesis twenty four forty three, where it speaks of a woman being sought as a bride for Isaac. It is interesting to note that the etymology of the English word virgin shows that centuries ago it could be defined as maiden, unwedded girl, or woman, according to the online etymology, etymology dictionary at uh, etymonline.com. In other words, the word virgin was used to refer to a person of a specific gender, female, and of a specific age, old enough to get married, and of a specific marital status, unmarried, just like the usage of the word Alma in Hebrew, uh, in Genesis 24:43 and in other Bible passages. Now, that is the end of what this has to say here. There's a few things I would personally like to say, really quick. Um, namely, that Alma, more often than not, would be referring to a virgin, though it did not explicitly mean virgin. So, ex a word that explicitly means virgin would be like, uh, batula, right? Which is the Hebrew word for, and I might have pronounced that wrong, I am still learning the Hebrew language. Um, but I believe it's batula, is how you say that. Um, and that word actually directly means virgin in the way that we use contemporarily the word virgin, right? Somebody who has not had sex. Um, specifically, I believe it refers to a woman who has not had sex. The word Alma, however, as it already pointed out in Genesis 24, 43, can. And it usually refers to somebody who is expected religiously and culturally to be a virgin in the uh, female gender, of course, right? Um, there is a male equivalent. Um, I cannot, for the life of me, remember it right now, but if it actually comes to me, I'll let you guys know. Uh, but nonetheless, it would be very odd in Israel for this person, this Alma, to not be a virgin. In fact, if they weren't a virgin, more often than not, they were either a harlot or somebody who was very likely to get stoned to death because of the Old Testament law. Um, now, that's, that's the first thing. Okay. Uh, the second thing is that the Septuagint translation actually renders the word uh, exactly the same, right? Uh, in other words, so they were just kind of explaining, right, how the word virgin used to have a meaning that was analogous to the meaning of Alma, right? Well, you can kind of see that progression even through separate languages in that Alma was translated into a Greek word, I believe... Oh, shoot. I'm going to have to look this up for a minute. Because I, I have a word in my head, I really don't know if I want to use that word because I don't know if that's a modern Greek word for virgin. Um, so, Septuagint, use of virgin. Word. 
All right. And while we're doing that, right, so um, like I said, it was, it was somebody who's going to be very strange here. Yes, okay, so I was right. All right. It's uh, Parthenos. And Parthenos means virgin. Um, it's translated there in um, Exodus 22.16. It's translated there in Isaiah 7.14. It's translated there in Genesis um, 24 through 43, right? So the Septuagint translation seems to think that the original wording was meant to imply that it was a virgin. Okay. Um, and it says right here, of course, in another place, um, this is only a Wikipedia, but it says, however, the Greek translation, the Septuagint rendered Alma as Parthenos, a word which means virgin. Um, so you, you see here that um, the Greek Septuagint translation, the translation that everybody in the entire world who was reading a Bible, with the exception of Pharisees, would have been reading, would have rendered this word virgin. And then the third thing is that it wouldn't really be much of a sign if it was just a young woman who bore a child, okay, um, that would be like, oh, okay, it's a young woman who bore a child. What else is new? Next, you're going to tell me that a dog is going to eat dog food for a sign, right? Um, but no, of course, that's not what the Lord actually means. What he means is something miraculous is going to happen. So three things there, right? Thing number one, uh, Alma can mean virgin just because it does not explicitly mean virgin. Like Bethula does not mean that it does not mean virgin, okay? Point number two. In the Septuagint, the Greek version, it is translated as virgin or Parthenos. And point number three, it would not be a sign if a regular young girl bore a child. That would be the equivalent of saying a regular dog ate dog food. Okay. Now, let's get to the actual article here. Not actual article, actual reading of the text here. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And of course, this is talking to one of the kings. In fact, let's go ahead and put this in some context here. We'll start with 12 and go to 15. So, Gen uh, not Genesis, sorry, Isaiah. We're going to start at 12 and go to 15. And Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Ahaz is saying, after Isaiah has given him the ability to ask the Lord for a sign, Ahaz is saying, no, I will not do so. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, it is a small thing for you to weary men, but ye will weary my God also. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil, and choose the good. So the, the first thing, of course, is that the it says that a virgin shall conceive, and that we should call his name Emmanuel. And we, of course, see perfect fruition of this in Jesus Christ, in that he is born of a virgin, and that he is God with us, or God among us, or literally, Emmanuel. Now, a lot of people have asked, well, why isn't that his specific name, right? He is, of course, named uh, Jesus, or Yeshua. Um, and there are, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know if it necessarily matters, considering all the other names that it is said the Messiah will be given, and those aren't his name either. For example, uh, Mighty God, El Gabor, right? Uh, Mighty Counselor is a great counselor, uh, one of the two. We'll actually read it later on in the day, so it will be able to catch me. Um, you know, and etc., right? So, we see here very plainly that these titles don't necessarily have to be the names. So, even though he's called Emmanuel, that doesn't necessarily have to be his name. Also, the name Yeshua is actually, believe it or not, it's a very um, meaningful name. Uh, the name Yeshua essentially translates as Jehovah Saves, um, which, I mean, is incredible, right? When you consider what it is that the Messiah actually came here to do and um, what it is, you know, in, in, in God's grand scheme, right, that that uh, this entire episode was meant for, right, was for the salvation of the saints. So knowing that his name is uh, Jehovah Saves in Yeshua, right, that, that's a pretty cool name, though, and I, th and I think that's why... Uh, that's why the Lord would have chosen that. Uh, but, you know, we see very clear fruition here. Born of a virgin and um, called God with us, right? Now, let's continue. Go to the Bible prophecies here, and we go to Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. And, of course, going to pull that up here in Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. And then let's go ahead and read what the article has to say itself. 
In Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, which was written about 700 years before the time of Jesus, the prophet Isaiah spoke of a son no, um, who would be called Mighty God and Eternal Father. Of course, terms that only God himself can be called. Isaiah also indicated that this son would reign on the throne of King David and that this reign would be everlasting. Christians acknowledge that this prophecy is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who is descended of King David and whose reign is everlasting. Today, the teachings of Jesus govern the lives of as many as an estimated 2 billion Christians worldwide. The New Testament also says that Jesus will return in the future and that his kingdom will have no end. And then we go to the actual reading here. It says, starting at verse 6, chapter 9 of the book of Isaiah, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now let's pause real quick, okay? We already have seen here fruition of this prophecy because we know, and we'll actually go ahead and pull up Matthew here. Matthew, and we'll go to the slaughter of the innocents. All right, let's see. There it is. And we're not going to... Well, yeah, let's go ahead and read it now so we can do it. Uh, this is Matthew... Remember, we paused from Isaiah real quick. This is Matthew 2, verses 16 through 18. Then Herod, when he saw what that he was, um, then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled the prophecy. Um, then what was? Ah, excuse me. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, "Quote." A voice, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. So we actually see the fruition of two prophecies here, and that the government is on his shoulder, a la Isaiah, and uh, the slaughter of the innocents, a la the book of Jeremiah. But let's go back to Isaiah here. We're going to start at 9-6 again. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Right, and we, So we saw that with the slaughter of the innocents. We will also, of course, see that with the government executing him, at least so they thought, in the form of the crucifixion. And his name shall be Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And of course, there was a son born to the Israelite people who was called Mighty God, who was called Everlasting Father, and who was called Prince of Peace. We know his name today as Jesus. Jesus' uh, reign has still ceased to end. He is still constantly going around with the message, uh, revealing himself to sinners, saving them, leading them to repentance, baptizing them with the Holy Spirit, right? Um, absolutely incredible things, of course. Right, So we see, again, a fruition of this prophecy all the way down to the T, to the names, to the fact that um, the son has been given, right, to the fact that the government is upon his shoulders. And, of course, the only thing that has not come to pass so far is the everlasting kingdom, which, of course, we will see um, in the second coming. Continuing on, because there is many, many, many more prophecies, messianically speaking, than there was yesterday. Of course, there is loud noises coming up. Just a moment, friends. Inside my own house, I still can't get away from the noise. It's ridiculous. I left my cat outside. Here, look. All right, sorry about that, friends. Getting back to the actual articles here and such. <coughs> All right. Nations would seek counsel of Jesse's descendants. I'm only going to briefly read this one because we actually already read it on yesterday's episode. Uh, but just going down here to the actual writing itself. Um, starting at Isaiah 11, verse 1. Going all the way to 10. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of power. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. 
And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears from his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and the breath of his lips will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, and the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play uh, near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand in the vipe's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. Uh, real quick, I do want to say briefly, just because it's pretty awesome, the Lord our God cares very tremendously about animals. And I just find that to be amazing, right? He cares about all his creation. He cares about the sparrows. He cares about the cobras. He cares about the ox. He cares about the lion, right? He wants the ox and the lion to eat together, both eating straw, collectively, in what is true peace, right? Not the false kumbayas that I always like to talk about uh, with, you know, these international governments, but true, genuine, God-given peace. So much so that the animals themselves are making peace with each other, right? Um, and of course, we see fruition of this prophecy in that nations have sought a counsel of, sought the counsel of Jesse's descendant, i.e. Jesus Christ. But we continue. Um, going to Isaiah 35, 4 and 6. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thirty-five, four through six. I wrote twenty-five. My apologies, friends. Alrighty, and we go to the article first, of course. Isaiah lived about twenty-seven hundred years ago. Prophesied that there would be a that there would come a time when God would arrive and heal the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf, the mobility of the lame, and the voice of the mute. Jesus did each of these things individually in a spiritual sense, um, in offering truth and salvation, and in a literal sense by performing the miracles of healing. Let's go ahead and read. There's actually a very short writing about it. Isaiah 35, starting at chapter 4, starting, excuse me, starting at verse 4. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong and fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be un uh, unstopped. Then shall the lame men leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. Alright, and we know that Jesus actually had every single one of those specific miracles done. Uh, excuse me. And we're going to go ahead and look them up here real quick. Okay. So, first thing we had is Jesus heals the blind. Okay. So, let's see here. I'm going to type in Jesus heals the blind. And what will pop up? Well, John 9 pops up. And now, why would John 9 pop up? Maybe because that's exactly what happened. Let's read. This is actually out of the New International Version. I'm not going to take the time to look for the King James because I just looked this up online. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it matters, quite frankly. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground and made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eye. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Uh, so the man sent and washed and came home seeing. What do you know? Jesus has healed the blind, right? Um, and it says, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am that man. Now, uh, how then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it in my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is the man, they asked him. I do not know. 
he said. And they have the, Ph the Pharisees, of course, investigate the healing here. Um, they ask things, for example, uh, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath, is one of the things they say. They say, how can a sinner perform such signs? Uh, what have you to say about him? It was uh, your eyes he opened. And the man replies, he's a prophet, right? And, so, and then we're not going to read that particular part, but if you'd like to read that part, um, and you were just reading along with me, right, that is starting exactly where we left off, John 9, 13. But, so, we see Jesus heals the blind. Well, what else did it say Jesus would do? It said he would open the ears of the deaf. So let's look up to Jesus heal the deaf. All right. Mark 7, 31 through 37. Let's read. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took from aside, took him aside rather, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, and excuse me if I pronounce this wrong, Ephatha, which means be opened. Ephatha, I believe, is how you pronounce that. That is a Aramaic word, actually, I believe. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. So now we see, not only is Jesus healing the deaf, he's also healing the mute. So two of the four things in this one passage. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. <laughs> kind of funny how that works. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. So, the blind have seen, the mute have spoken, the deaf have heard. What is the very last one that we have here? The lame man shall be able to walk, right? Well, let's see. Did Jesus heal the lame? By the way, a little fun fact for you guys who are watching this and may be wondering, lame? I thought that meant like you were a loser or something. Well, actually, the word lame um, means that you are basically crippled, essentially. Um, and you'll you'll see a lot of that throughout studying these words. Uh, they use the word dumb quite often. The word dumb does not mean stupid. The word dumb means you cannot speak. Nonetheless, though, um, I really do not like a New Living Translation, so I think I will take the time to find the KGV on this one. Mark numero dos, or John 5, either way. Let's go with John 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there at Jerusalem, by the sheep market at Pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethsida, or Beth, Beth, Bethesda, excuse me, having five porches. Bethesda. I knew that. I don't know why it was so hard for me to say that. I apologize. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down in a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. And when Jesus saw him lie, not lie as in lying, um, but lie as in lying down. So not, not, he's not, not telling the truth, he's lying down, is what I meant to say. Um, when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been a now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. And of course it goes on to say, The Jews therefore said unto him that he was cured, it is, uh, it is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry the bed and so on and so forth. We just ended at 10. If you'd like to continue, that is going to be John 5, starting at 11. So, Jesus does all the things that he has prophesied to do specifically. He heals the blind, he uh, heals the deaf, he heals the, um, the dumb, and he heals the lame, right? So all the specific things he has prophesied to do, specific miracles he's prophesied to do, he does. And of course, there are many others, right? He raises Lazarus from the dead. 
um, he lets the uh, disciples know, the apostles, right, lets them know that if a uh, poisonous thing is to bite them, then no harm will come to them, right, which is another example of his healing, and etc. Um, there are, of course, numerous uh, instances of modern day healing where the Lord has healed people to this day. In fact, a pretty incredible story I'll get to very briefly. Um, in a uh, reverend by the name of Ken Boyer up in Canada. Now, Ken Boyer did recently pass away, um, which was a little unfortunate. I think a lot of people expected him to make a full recovery. I certainly did. Um, the Lord, of course, works in whatever ways he would like to. However, he was healed, right? Uh, he had a brain tumor that was, I mean, it is huge, right? It, the thing was probably causing, you know, you to actually be able to, Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, bud. Oh, you cannot. Uh, my cat really wants to cuddle. Anyways, um, really, really bad um, brain tumor here, right? Something that was very, very large, something that was definitely going to kill him. The doctor said he had absolutely no hope. And eventually, he actually could not even turn over in his own bed. He refused to take any medication. He refused to take any chemotherapy. And so this was only made worse and worse. No, but you can't do that. Um, until eventually, in the course of a week, he managed to not only get his strength back enough to feed himself, his strength back enough to turn in bed, but strength back, strength back enough to preach an entire two-hour sermon, which, unfortunately, I have yet to hear it was the last sermon he ever preached. I imagine it was probably pretty great, considering that the Lord literally gave him one last burst of strength for this particular sermon. Um... I have a feeling it was a great one, but I haven't actually listened to it as of yet. Um, just an incredible example of, and you know, we even have actually examples, you know, that's one example that, you know, the Lord healed for a time. We have examples of the Lord healing, period, in the modern age, right? There was a young girl that my pastor actually, um, and you can see this on video, like the, the healing itself, you can't see on video, but she enters in the church, clearly a cripple, and leaves the church clearly whole. Okay, and they prayed over her, called her out from the pulpit, right? And this, her, um, basically, her arm was just completely messed up. The, the you don't know exactly what had happened to her. And honestly, and I don't mean to be rude, so I do apologize if I sound rude. I genuinely do not mean it. Um, it kind of looked like she kind of like like her arm had gotten caught in an elevator almost, or not an elevator, an escalator. You know what I mean? Like it's just really ripped up and just shattered almost, right? All better. Left the church, all better. Why? Because the Lord is amazing and can do absolutely phenomenal things. Uh, there are, you know, people who claim that they have, um, their cancers have been gone, that their the amputees have been healed, right? So the Lord heals constantly, even outside of uh, his earthly life, uh, in the physical at least, right? But even in his earthly life, in the physical, during this ministry, he healed in all of the four specific ways that it was said he was going to. However... Let us continue. We have more awesome prophecies for our amazing Messiah to read. Now we go to Isaiah 40, 1 through 5, and also verse 9. I'm not going to skip to verse 9. I'm actually just going to read the whole thing. So we're going to read 1 through 9. Yeah, you guys can probably see my cat now. Huh? Yeah, this is Chunk, and Chunk does not care at all that I'm doing a video. <laughs> Isn't that right, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> The Messiah would be preceded by a messenger. In Isaiah 43, 40 verse 3, the prophet writes about a person in the desert who prepares the way for the Lord. This prophecy foreshadowed the life of John the Baptist, who played an important role in preparing the groundwork for the ministry of Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ, right? Jesus was born shortly after John the Baptist, at about, uh, about 2,000 years ago. The New Testament books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John include details about John the Baptist. Matthew 3, for example, we are told that John the Baptist preached in the desert of Judea and that he baptized Jesus. In John 1, 29-34, John the Baptist announced that Jesus is the Son of God and that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Alright, and so, I already have the uh, main thing up here, right, where we're going to go to um, Isaiah 40, but I do want to actually look up from Matthew, where it says that this prophecy was fulfilled, to kind of just give you guys a little bit of an understanding of when it was actually fulfilled here. And I believe that is Matthew 3, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's what the article just says as well. Voice in the wilderness. Indeed, indeed, indeed. 
and it goes to Matthew 3, 3. So if you guys are looking for that, look up Matthew 3, 3, where it says, and actually we're not going to read that quite yet. We have something else to read. So let's go to Isaiah, Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 9. Comfort ye, comfort my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Right? And we'll, we'll, we'll get to there in a minute, but remember this. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. We'll get to the meaning of that in just a second. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The voice said, Cry, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, wither, uh, withereth my apologies, the flower fadeth, but the, Lord of our God, the word of our God shall stand forever. O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountains, O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up and be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Now, where did we see the fruition of this? Well, real quickly, if we go to Matthew 3.3, 3, we can see, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, which is a Greek rendering of Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, you may be wondering to yourself, Well, just because the book of Matthew describes John the Baptist as being the fulfillment of this prophecy, that doesn't necessarily mean that he is, right? Well, I mean, that kind of depends on that description. Remember what I said about remembering the phrase, a voice which cries out in the wilderness, right? Well, it is very well known that John the Baptist was actually somebody who lived out in the wilderness. In fact, if we go to Luke, which is what we're going to go to now, we're going to go to Luke 1, okay, and read a little bit here. I believe it is Luke 1. It might be 2, actually. Do Luke. And we are going to see here that John the... <coughs> what we would actually call him today is essentially be a hobo, honestly. And I mean no disrespect to him, because clearly that is what the Lord wanted him to do. And really... There's actually nothing wrong with that at all. Um, the fact that he removed himself from all material possessions is actually probably a very positive thing. Um, but it's a Luke 3, not Luke 1 or 2. I don't know why I said that. All right, it says, Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being the Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Eteria, and the region of Tre um, Trachontus, Trachontus and Lacinius, Tetrarch of Abilene. While Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all... I know why I was getting confused. It's because of the birth narrative of John. Anyways. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance and remission. Now, where did it come to him? It came to him in the wilderness, right? Because that's where he was hanging out. He would be somebody who would actually go out and hang out in the wilderness. And it actually says, and I don't really remember if it's here or if it is... Um, in Matthew, I'm not really going to continue reading, but he actually lives so far in the wilderness as to not be able to um, buy from the farmers or the markets, right? Or to go fishing or things like that, right? He eats locusts and honey. Um, and it says, uh, as it is spoken in the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked place shall be made straight, the rough way is smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So we see here, not only does both Matthew and Luke affirm, yes, this is the fulfillment of that prophecy, but we can actually see, without them telling us straight up, 
that this is the fulfillment of that prophecy, because number one, John came before the coming of the Lord. Number two, he cried out from the wilderness. Number three, he tried to make the path straight and actually successfully did so. He turned a lot of people towards the eventual Messiah's message, right? Made the path straight for the Lord to arrive, right? As, of course, anyone would with a king. You send a messenger and then you let the king arrive, right? So, even more fulfillment of Bible prophecy here in the Messianic sense. And we see a lot of these things are, I mean, they're so obvious as to be very questionable as to anyone, how anyone actually denies the Messiahship of Jesus. Um, you know, when it comes to him being called a God with us or El Gabor, right? Well, a lot of people say the Messiah is not supposed to be divine. Uh, you, you show me another human being who can get the term everlasting father, and I might agree with you. But being as that that's not possible for you to show me, I will never agree with that sentiment. I'm sorry. That's just simply the way it is. Um, you know, we see here in John the Baptist. Well, if Jesus wasn't the Messiah, if he wasn't the Lord incarnate, then what's the deal with John the Baptist? And why did the people of the time consider John the Baptist to be a prophet? Because we know they did from multiple different accounts. We know they did not only from the scriptures here, but we also know that Josephus Flavius from, um, mentions that Herod was actually worried about killing John, and that after he killed John, the people of Israel said that the, um, that the attacks against him, specifically the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, was specifically because he had executed John. Right, So the people thought of John as a prophet. Uh, we know that from multiple sources, not all of which are Christian, some of which are Jewish, some of which are even pagan. Okay, And yet, what, he just came in front of no one, right? There was just no paths for him to set straight. He never was actually giving us a prophetic message, and that was all just for naught. That seems a little odd to me. So I would like somebody to explain to me, why is it, if John the Baptist is not the forerunner of the Messiah, then what's his point? Now, of course, maybe a lot of contemporary Jews and Orthodox Jews these days are going to say, well, John the Baptist wasn't a prophet. Okay, you might believe that, but you are at odds, not only with the entire Christian faith, but with the people that you are your ancestors in, in faith, right? Your ancestors in faith, the old Jews of that time, the pre-Talmudic old Jews said John the Baptist was a prophet. Facts, okay? Just a fact, and his prophecies, his ministry, his message is completely pointless if he did not forerun the Messiah. Well, we continue because there's even more blatantly amazing, blatantly obvious rather, and utterly amazing evidence. Uh, the Messiah would be a light to the Gentiles. We kind of read this yesterday, but we can go ahead and read it again. In Isaiah 42, 1 through 9, the prophet Isaiah speaks of a servant of God who will be a light to the Gentiles, or non-Jews, otherwise known as Goyim, which means nations, and bring justice to the world, uh, bring justice to the world. Christians believe that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of this promise. Jesus' teachings govern the lives of Christians throughout the world. Some estimate the, uh, some estimate the claims that there are as many as 2 billion worldwide more follow the teachings of Jesus than of any other person in history. Of course, very true. And let's go to Isaiah 42, 1 through 9, which if you're on the phone will be nice and convenient because you'll just have to replace the number zero with the number two. So that'll be easy. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. So first off, he does bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. We have seen Jesus do that. How have we seen Jesus do that? Well, after his crucifixion, the Roman Empire was on a slow and consistent, but nevertheless, a falling pattern for the next 400 years. Um, in the case of numerous nations, actually, we've seen uh, receive the judgment of God, right? The destruction at Pompeii. We saw the... Um, the destruction of Nazi Germany, right? We've seen the um, Holocaust, which I, I hate to um, say this because I know it sounds cruel, but let's be perfectly clear here. If Jesus was the Messiah, then that was very, very probably a punishment against the Jews, okay? Um, not that that needs to be something we carry into now. That's obviously over and only God can punish, but nonetheless. He shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. <coughs> Excuse me. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set forth judgment till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith the Lord God thus saith God the Lord, rather, 
He that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spre uh, spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walketh therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant for the, of the people, uh, for a light to the Gentiles. And there we have right, the phrase, light to the Gentiles. To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prisons, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Of course, he has opened the blind eyes, both spiritually and physically, and he does, spiritually speaking, let those who are in the prisons, the chains of hell, the chains of death and sin, out of the darkness, right? I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Let me just point out very quickly that this is a perfect example of why you cannot have a trinity, but we'll move on. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and the new things do I declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Of course, just letting you know that he prophesies. Well, again, we see perfect fruition of this prophecy. Of course, why wouldn't we? They're prophecies of the Lord. Um, we see this in the fact that virtually every Gentile nation on the entire planet seeks counsel of Jesse's descendant, or as it's phrased in this particular passage, is made, um, is using Jesus as a light to them, right? We see this in the Armenians, the Assyrians, a lot of different Arabs, the Maronites, the English, the Brit uh, not the British, sorry, the Scottish, the Germans, the French, the Russians, a lot of Chinese people, a lot of American people here, right? The Canadians, the Mexicans, etc., etc., etc. Non-Jewish people all over the world who seek Jesus as a light to the Gentiles, right? And by the way, real quickly, in case any Muslims want to say that this is a prophecy of Muhammad, I've heard it, not a lot of apologists say this because they recognize this is completely ridiculous. Um, that's not possible unless Muhammad was the Messiah. So, sorry, we're just kind of done with that conversation. Anyways, Again, perfect fruition of the prophecy, undeniable fruition of the prophecy. Who else, who of Jewish descent, who else of uh, the Israelite tribes, who else of the um, line of David, right, has ever actually been inspirational to all the world, who's been a light to the Gentiles, right? Certainly not Moses. Look, I love Moses. Moses was a great prophet. His laws, um, of course, you know, they came from the Lord, so of course they were perfection, right? Um However, you don't see Moses being quoted in the streets of Great Britain, do you? Or Russia, or Mongolia, or Thailand, or Mexico, or the United States, etc. Okay? Um, you don't see Haley Selassie may or may not be a descendant of David. I don't know. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. But you don't see him being paraded through the streets as somebody who is a light to all the world. Okay? Uh, you don't see Abraham being portrayed, uh, paraded through the, seat, uh, the streets of somebody who's a light to all the world. You don't see King David, right? Very important people. You, know, you do see, though, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. But we continue. There is still more. I only got 14 minutes left, so I might not even be able to finish this. But there is still more for us to uh, go through. Uh, God's salvation would reach the ends of the earth. We'll just briefly read that because we read it yesterday. Um... It is too small a thing for you to be my servants to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel um, I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, and you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. This is, of course, we see perfect fruition of this in the fact that Christianity is the only religion that has ever been brought to the ends of the earth. Even with the advent of television, radio, and the internet, Islam has still not managed to do so. Um, Hinduism has still not managed to do so. Buddhism has still not managed to do so. The words of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, have definitely managed to do so. Uh, Jesus will be spat upon and beaten. This is Isaiah 50 and 6. 50 and 6. And of course, we're getting close to the big one, which I'm sure you guys remember, which is, of course, Isaiah 53. The prophet Isaiah received many prophecies from God about the Messiah about 700 years before the Messiah was born. And it's going to continuously reference that because each article is technically an individual one. In Isaiah's prophecies, he often referred to the Messiah as a servant. In Isaiah 50 and 6, Isaiah wrote about the abuse that the Messiah would endure at the hands of sinful people, that he would offer his back to those who beat him, his face to those who uh, rip out his beard, and himself to those who mock and taunt him. 
Christians historically have acknowledged this Old Testament prophecy as being fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Jesus, as explained in the New Testament, was beaten, mocked, and taunted shortly after his crucifixion by the Romans. And in Matthew 26, 27, we read, Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hits you? Of course, they are mocking him. What does it say in Isaiah 50 and 6? Well, this is in Isaiah 50 and 6. What does it say in Isaiah 50 and 6? I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. It even specifically references the exact things that they do to him, for example, plucking off his hair and spitting on him, right? But we continue, and I am kind of trying to rush through this because I know that the long one, Isaiah 53, Yep, and that's actually what we're at now. So let's go up to Isaiah 53. We're going to read the entire chapter, actually. And here on this chapter, we are going to be seeing a few things. The Messiah would be the Messiah would be rejected. He would die for our sins. He would be silent before his accusers. He would be buried in a rich man's tomb. He would be numbered with the transgressors. Okay? Those are the five things you need to look for in Isaiah 53. So let's go out to that. Um, I don't no, if I really should, well, maybe I'll read all of them after, but since it's four individual, or five rather individual articles, things, right, little things to go read in, um, I don't know about that, but let's get to Isaiah 53. We're going to start at verse 1 and read the entire thing, okay? Who hath believed our report? Of course, this is the question being asked uh, uh, by Isaiah about the Messiah. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Okay, so he's not going to come in a you know in a flaming chariot with golden armor and a massive sword to slay all the enemies of Israel, right? As the Jews would expect. That's not how it's going to happen. Okay. Of course, that's how the second coming is going to happen. Well, not exactly like that. Obviously, I was exaggerating and being sort of facetious. But um, nonetheless, right? That, that's not how he's going to come. He's going to come with no beauty that we should desire him. Sound like Jesus to you? Certainly sounds like Jesus, the carpenter who was about the age of 30, give or take, and yet looked like he was about the age of 50, right? Um, who was walking around wandering with his sandals and 12 other men, and that's it, right? around Jerusalem with no home, no place to rest his head, right? No beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. Was Jesus despised and rejected of men? Yeah, I kind of think they nailed him to a stick as a result of it. Quite literally. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Well, kind of difficult to have a prophecy that says you're going to reject the Messiah and then not buy him as the Messiah after you rejected him. I just want to point that out. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him, um, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. I seem to recall a lot of Orthodox Jewish folk telling me that it is actually not uh, in the Bible that the Messiah is going to be somebody who dies for your sins. Well, I seem to be reading in the words of Isaiah here, pretty plainly, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are, he are healed. Rather, I said our, right? We are healed. This is plain as day. There was literally no possible way to interpret this other than the fulfillment that is in Christ Jesus. And I, of course, would love to see anybody respond to me otherwise. I like good discussions. They're always fun. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of all of us. Very little faith in the Jewish community at these days. I don't know if that's exactly what this is supposed to be saying. Kind of seems like it, though. He was oppressed 
Of course he was oppressed. It was the government who killed him. And he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. What did they say? Prophesy, who is it that struck you? Right? And Jesus responded, of course, with nothing. He is not going to respond to his accusers, because thus saith the Lord, he is not going to respond to his accusers. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was stricken. There you have again him being stricken for the iniquities, the transgressions, the sins of other people. Specifically, in this case, the Israelites. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be justified. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. He bore the sins of many. What do they always tell you the Messiah doesn't do? Bore the sins, bear the sins of many, right? Um, he uh, made intercession for the transgressors. What do they say that the Messiah doesn't do? Make intercession for transgressions. Well, Isaiah would beg to differ. And Jesus Christ would, of course, as well, being the Messiah and having come in as an intercessor, as an intercessor for our transgressions. He was numbered among the transgressors. When he was nailed on the cross, who was beside him? Criminals, right? He was being charged as a criminal. Right? So, I mean, we can, we can continuously go on, right? By our stripes, we are healed. Who in the entire world has that been said of? Now, I know some of you ridiculous Christ mythers are going to come up here and say Krishna or something nonsensical like that, right? Um, I will do a video on that abhorrent topic at some point. Um, but no, you're wrong, and just please move along, okay? But to those who are actually serious, okay, who else has done that? Who else has said by their stripes, who else has um, had their stripes be something that are given to them for the healing of other people, if not Jesus Christ? Specifically, somebody who follows Yeshua, or somebody who follows Jehovah, rather, right? You're not going to find anyone. You're not going to find anyone. Absolutely no one. Okay, and the reason is because this prophecy is about Jesus. And you know the thing is too, you more often than not can actually read Isaiah 53. I'm sure while I was reading that, people are just thinking, well, yeah, obviously it's Jesus, right? Because that's how obvious it is. Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 make it literally impossible to deny Jesus as the Messiah. So is Daniel 9, actually. But um I mean it's not possible. You couldn't try if you if you wanted to, you could make this whole big, you know, thousand page argument, and it would get a Big ol' fat F minus, because clearly you can't read plain language if you think this prophecy is not about Messiah Jesus. Um, and I say that in all respect, but, you know, to a certain extent, we need to start asking people, at what point is it that you are going to begin accepting this plainly obvious prophetic word from the Lord our God? And in the case of the Jewish folk, I would just like to point out, you worship the same God I do, why do you reject, reject part, part of his message? Why do you only want to partially adapt his message? I don't understand that. Last thing here, Isaiah foreshadows the ministry of Jesus in Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. In Isaiah 61, there are passages that speak of an anointed one who preaches the good news to the poor, frees the people who are imprisoned, heals the blind, and releases the oppressed. About 700 years after the time of Isaiah, Jesus relates these Bible passages to himself. This is done in Luke 4, 14-21. This is the NIV translation, and it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and, uh, knew about his, uh, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went up to Nazareth. There he had been brought up, um, where, rather, he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and rolling it, he found the place where it is written, 
Um, quote, the Lord, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recover of the and recovery of the sight to the blind to release the oppressed. To proclaim the fear of the Lord, or the year rather of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up, end quote, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That ends the reading. At this point during the ministry of Jesus, he had already been preaching the good news to the poor, and he had already healed many of various afflictions, including blindness, both in a physical sense and a spiritual one. But Jesus had not yet begun the other part of his mission, which includes a day of vengeance, vengeance which Bible scholar John Gill explains, quote, as the day of vengeance of God, when vengeance was taken on sin in the person of Christ, when he destroyed the works of the devil. And who will take vengeance on Antichrist at his spiritual coming and upon all the uh, wicked at the day of judgment. End quote. With this in mind, it is interesting that Jesus stopped reading Isaiah 61 midway through verse 2 immediately before the mention of a day of vengeance. And um, I'm going to read here Isaiah 61, 1, 2, although we kind of already did read it as it is quoted in Luke. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Fun fact, good news actually translates literally in Greek as gospel. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Um, instead of prisoners, the Greek Septuagint renders the word blind. I believe the King James Version actually renders that as blind as well. This was in the New International Version because I didn't actually go to my Bible. I read it off of the aboutbibleprophecy.com. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. I mean, to a certain extent, once you look at the prophecies of Genesis and the prophecies that are given to Ishmael, when you look at the prophecies of Daniel, when you look at the Messianic prophecies of Isaiah and the non-Messianic prophecies of Isaiah, to a certain extent, it kind of, it becomes almost ridiculous to have these conversations. And I don't say that in any sort of insult whatsoever. I don't say that in any sort of self-righteousness whatsoever. However, you must understand that when you are able to read words coming off of a book centuries, decades, sometimes millennia before the events happened, and we can prove that these came before the events happened. Because as I told you guys yesterday, we have a complete copy of the Isaiah scroll. Between 350 and 150 BC is when that scroll was written. Jesus' ministry is between 30 and 33 AD. Everything we read today was prophesied before the fact, and we can prove that beyond any shadow of a doubt. At what point are you going to seriously continue to deny this? I mean, to a certain extent, you just, you can't. You, you have to understand that you are doing this at your own peril, that you are disregarding what can clearly be shown to be, I mean, forget Nostradamus and his quatrains, his incredibly vague prophecies and predictions, quote unquote. This is telling you straight up exactly what's going to happen, and then it happens, thus saith the Lord. <clears throat> so, just think about that for a moment, a moment. Nonetheless, though, <clears throat> it is now an hour and 36 seconds that we've been on, so we're going to go ahead and say a brief prayer, have some announcements, and then we'll be done. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for having the ability to read this word, Lord. I thank you for the reading of your word. I thank you for the ability to have your word, Lord Jesus. I know many a Christian have to simply take on faith your words, Lord. We actually have the ability to see here your amazing prophecies and the, the proof in, in the pudding, if you will, Lord, of those prophecies coming to pass in their exquisite detail. I ask that you just use this video for nothing more than glorification of your word and your kingdom and to lead others to repent and to seek you, Lord Jesus. And we give you all of the glory in Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen and hallelujah. All right. Uh, so please do like and share this video if you enjoyed. Uh, any comments, you know, questions, comments, concerns, criticisms, whatever, that is what the comment section below is for. And any and all people who present actual arguments and are not unbearably rude will be responded to. You have my word. Um... If you consistently like our content, please do subscribe here to the American Cynic Party channel. Uh, every subscription, of course, is incredibly helpful. Uh, make sure you give all glory to the Lord, of course, because I am nothing without him. 
um, and all this information I am blessed to have received simply by his spirit presenting it to me and nothing more. Um, if you would like to follow us other places, you can like our page on Facebook where these are posted as well as our watchdogs, the American Cynic Party. Um, it's the American Cynic Party channel with the lack of the word channel there, right? Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at Terrestrial Earthbird or uh, ACP Official. Um, and you can follow us on Gab at CJ Cox or at uh, ACP Official. You can also go to at Cynic Thought where you can follow us on Instagram. So thank you guys very much for watching. Shalom. Have a phenomenal rest of your evening. And remember to have great fellowship with the Lord because he loves you and he wants you to be a part of his family.